so I'm Gregory Bard, and uh, I teach at the University of Wisconsin Stout. My areas are mathematics and computer science, especially their overlap. Uh, and so uh, mostly I do crypto, and I also work in computer algebra. Uh, and so just to give you an idea, these are the courses that I teach. Uh, I have a crypto course, which I, I love. Um, I have a course in computer security that I teach. I teach discrete math, which I imagine most of you have taken. Um, I also teach scientific computing. Uh, and then, like most people with a PhD in math, I teach calculus pretty often. Usually it's calculus too, sometimes up or down from there. Uh, and for about a decade, I had to teach the uh, math for business students. Uh, so, okay, so now um, I'm a little bit better known for the books that I've written. So I wrote a book about uh, algebraic cryptanalysis, it's published by Springer in 2009. Uh, and then I wrote a book about the computer algebra system SAGE. Uh, so Sage is free mathematical software. It does the same thing that Maple, Mathematica, Magma, MATLAB do, but it's free, which is nice. And my book is free in electronic form. So if you ever want to have a peek, uh, go ahead. It's on my webpage and, and available. I was working on a book for the business students to teach them basic financial mathematics. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's crossed out now. Um, and uh, now I'm working on a book for discrete math. Uh, and it's going to have a lot of cybersecurity applications, including crypto. Uh, so that we can talk about fun and modern things in discrete. And that one I'm going to release to the Creative Commons, so it's going to be uh, absolutely free. So um, I like to give a one slide summary before I dive into the intestines of the talk. So um, uh, in 2006, I was considering some questions about uh, passwords and computer security, in particular, how it touches uh, usability. Uh, so there's the human factors in design and uh, human-computer interaction were the phrases that we used at that time. Now I understand it's more fashionable to say user experience design, but the same thing, just a slightly different phrase. Um, so I created a scheme for spelling error tolerant, uh, reorder tolerant uh, passphrases based on some cool mathematical tools. So what that basically means is this is a password scheme where you're allowed to make spelling mistakes. Okay. Um, so I published a paper about it and moved on to other things. This is the original paper published by the American, uh, so, excuse me, American is not actually in that acronym, uh, published by the Association of Computing Machinery. So uh, hang on, okay. So if we're going to talk about passwords, the question that I get most often is, are passwords obsolete? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit complicated. So biometrics are really cool and hard to fake. Uh, and so, uh, and they impress customers, which is often why they're chosen. Uh, but they're expensive and they freak out a few customers. So often a data center will have a, a, a palm reader or a, a retinal scanner just to impress potential investors and for no actual security purpose. Uh, I mean, they tell the investor that it's for security, but. Um, uh, so, uh, but there are some people who are really freaked out about the idea of their fingerprints going to uh, some corporation uh, just for them to be able to use a product. Uh, and especially, you don't know who's going to buy that corporation later. It may be bought out, and that may be bought out, and that might be bought out, and then you know your data is going with that, right? Uh, so the European Union has recently enacted some new privacy laws. It's the um, GPDR, um, and uh, those require uh, special handling of biometric data. So there's one country, and I really should have remembered which one it is, but I don't remember which one right now, uh, that if you take the biometric data of their citizens, it has to live on a server in that country. So uh, there are some EU-wide com companies where they have a data center in that country, and then they have another one for the entire rest of the EU, just to meet that requirement. So uh, legal requirements are very important. Uh, there's also two-factor authentication. So our university uh, has that for just logging into our usual course management system. Uh, we use Desire to Learn. We're switching to Canvas. I guess you guys use Moodle. Is that right? Th they're all the same. Uh, but uh, we have two-factor authentication. So after you put your username and password in, a little uh, noise goes off on your phone, and you just click a button on your phone. So not terribly inconvenient unless you leave your phone at home. Uh, and then we have some super elderly faculty that don't have smartphones, so there's a little key fob that performs the same purpose uh, that they put on their keys. And you need your keys to unlock your office and to drive your car, so people tend not to forget their keys. Um, so this has gotten a heck of a lot easier with smartphones. Uh, in earlier eras, there were credit, size, credit card sized little devices. Uh, RSA made them, uh, so um, uh, that uh, whenever you wanted to log in, you'd hit a button and it would do a computation and enter a passcode, and that passcode was used only once. And then you'd enter it on your computer, and the next time you wanted to log in, you'd get a different passcode. 
So those are pretty cool too, but that was very expensive back when that was popular 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago. So, uh, okay, let's uh, look, about, look at a, a bigger view now, okay? So let's say you're designing a game, right? Do you really think that it's easy to get people to give up their fingerprints just so you can log into the game? I mean, you know, biometrics is probably not the right tool to solve the problem of securing access to your game. Uh, so um, uh, if it's a mobile app and it's doing something a little silly, like uh, let's say uh, your favorite brand of soda makes a mobile app that uh, it'll look at your location and tell you where the nearest vending machine is that sells that brand of soda, right? If someone were to do something like that, I would not want that to be authenticated with an uh, iris scanner or a retinal scanner. That seems disproportionate. How about a simple online shop for art majors to sell their products? Many of them might be really freaked out if they have to have be fingerprinted in order to use your little tool, right? Uh, so um, educational technology, for example, for learning foreign languages. So Duolingo is really fun. Uh, it's a great way to uh, keep your foreign language sharp. Uh, so um, you know it's uh, uh, being used by uh, eighth and ninth graders when they're first learning their foreign language for the first time. Uh, are you going to fingerprint them all, right? I mean, that's going to be a serious problem. Uh, E-government, so like for voting or registering your car or you know, uh, getting that little piece of paper that says, yes, you have health insurance and sending it with your taxes. Those processes need to be secured, right? We can't have your social security number getting out into the open. Uh, we can't have people voting five times, right? It's been very embarrassing when that's happened in the past. So um, in fact, there's a really fun article uh, about uh, this problem in Turkey where there's uh, one building where in one apartment uh, there are several hundred people living in it, all of whom are over 150 years old, and they voted in the most recent election. Mm. So it's a really good article and worth reading. I'll, I'll make sure it is emailed to you. Um, so for things like this, you want to have security, but you, you, you cannot guarantee. I mean, what happens if you try to use two-factor authentication here? It means that anybody without a cell phone can't vote, right? OK, that's not good, right? So. Um, okay, so we have to have population reasonableness. Uh, so biometrics for video game, probably a bad idea. Fingerprinting eighth graders to help them learn a foreign language or to learn fractions, probably you're going to upset at least one parent, maybe 10. Um, so uh, online banking is another one. So you have to think big when you think about your users. My mother is 81. She actually has pretty good computer skills, as it turns out, right? But I want her to be able to use as many sites as possible. Um, uh, you know, people who spent uh, the late 60s, early 70s in an altered state, right? These people need to be able to vote. They need to be able to register their car. Blind people, uh, you know, I mean, people with all sorts of impairments need to be able to use your technology. So there are some, uh, we have a lot of veterans at UW Stout. Um, some of them are missing arms. So, uh, you know, uh, it happens, right? So uh, people don't always come back with all the body parts that they uh, left with. So. Uh, if it has to be a thumbprint scan, that's a problem if the person lost their thumb in Afghanistan. Um, so, and then you also, I mean, they're intelligence gradients. So probably I should have censored that last bullet, but I didn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, so biometrics and two-factor authentication, yes, they're much better than passwords. But it seems for now that some applications simply require passwords, right? So we should talk about how to do well with passwords. So a lot of what I've talked about so far may be kind of obvious. So maybe here's something that's uh, a little bit less obvious. So uh, we've all heard of phishing attacks, right? So whaling is like phishing, but instead of going after many small targets, you have one big juicy target, right? So a secretary of a government department or a CFO of a, of a company or uh, maybe a, 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 a member of a state governor's cabinet or something like that, where you're really, really trying to go after their private data, uh, and you're willing to spend resources to get this one person. So lots of games, you have your user identity with a password for good reason. If you're going to have in-app purchases, right, or if there's risks of malicious players, if you're investing a lot of time in a game, you want things to be secure. So it's a very classic old-fashioned scheme. You find a government employee who's a gamer with some odd interests. They really like tanks, or they really like the Tudor period, right? Uh, so you make a game about the, the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Or uh, maybe uh, they really like uh, uh, Greco-Roman things, and so you make something with a Roman theme. Um, and then you make sure that this person finds out about it, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you make a game, of course, that's playable. So uh, and maybe they need to enter a username and password just to go to level two, right, after playing level one. Uh, so 
they're going to you know, put their email address in there and a password in there. If their password is, uh, or rather if their email address ends in yahoo.com or hotmail.com or gmail.com, there's a pretty good chance that the password that they choose for the game is the password for this email address, especially if they're a little bit unsophisticated about password security, right? So it's a pretty good scheme, uh, and for a certain type of user, I think it would work. Now, there is the caveat that most people don't use their gaming email account for serious business, but now you have their list of contacts, right? Uh, so that's already interesting. Uh, you can forge their identity, right? You can send emails as if you're them if you have their password. And then maybe you have some image files that are suitable for blackmail, right? So it could be good. Okay. So now we get to somewhat more technical details. How do we implement passwords? Okay. So super basics. Hopefully all of us know that passwords are never to be stored in a human readable fo uh, format. So the technical term is never stored in plain text. Uh, so when you create your password, it gets put usually through a hash function, and then the output is called a digest, and that's what's stored. Now this is a little vocabulary hiccup. A lot of people will refer to the output of the hash function as the hash. It's technically called the digest. Now I don't think if you make that error in an interview it would hurt you, but there is a very popular interview question coming up in a few slides, and it's one that has been asked of my students, so it's a good one to talk about. Um, so then there's this extra step when you generate your password and you store the uh, digest that comes out of the hash function, it's called salting, but it's a technical point, and I don't think we really need to go into it just yet, and if you're burning with curiosity about it, we can talk about it during question time. So there was this quote that I found, and I was so happy to find this quote, because I have to explain these things every time uh, I teach a computer security course, and you know, I often fumble over what's the best way to explain something, and this quote is way smarter than anything I've ever thought of. A hash function is like a blender. It turns your strawberries and bananas into a smoothie, which is pretty easy. However, it is not possible to turn the smoothie back into the original strawberries and bananas. Okay, so this gives you an idea of what a hash function is about. And so this comes from the blog Lifehacker, which is a pretty cool blog. Uh, and the author was uh, Nick Douglas. So in a way, it's an irreversible operation. That's the key point of a, of a hash. So the interview question is, what's the difference between hashing and encryption? So it really comes down to the irreversibility that hashing is irreversible, encryption is reversible, right? So if, you, uh, if your, your COO has a message and um, it needs to be transmitted in a really secure way, so you put it in an envelope and you burn it to ashes, that message is secure in the sense that none of your competitors will know what's in that message, but neither will the intended recipient, right? So encryption has to be reversible. Secure encryption is reversible only by those who have some required credential, so a secret key or a private key, depending on what crypto system you're using. So there was the Twitter password breach of 2018, so I understand you already talked about this, but it's good to talk about it again. Um, so when you create your password, it goes through a hash function, and the output of digest is stored instead. But somebody was debugging, so there was an issue with the login screen, and the programmer was debugging. So uh, the debugger made a, a, a log file, and this log file kept everything that was going in and out of the um, uh, appropriate piece of code that was taking care of, of the login screen. And uh, if everything is stored, that includes the, the passwords. And it was absolutely in plain text. Whatever the person wrote, whether it was the right password or the wrong one, it got stored along with the usernames. When the debugging was over, the programmer didn't remove the lines of code that sent the passwords of the users in plain text to the log file. So actual passwords of actual users ended up in the log file. So normally you have your development environment, and then you have your production environment, which are very far apart. And in between, you have uh, another environment, which is called stage. But these are supposed to be three different things. And so you take your debug code out before you launch it to the live website. So Twitter is a, a big, big company. It's a big website, a big uh, internet service. So the thing about uh, uh, Twitter is that um, if they cannot be trusted with our passwords, who can we trust, right? So because of this log file, the passwords of uh, something like 100 million people were compromised. So if we, if we cannot uh, trust Twitter, who can we trust, right? So this is why it's a, an unfortunate truth. You must never use the same password on two different websites. Now GitHub had the same thing happen in the same week. 
So, I mean, this is depressing, right? I mean, so, uh, you know, uh, please don't store passwords in plain text is maybe the simplest thing we could mention in a computer security course. And uh, Twitter and GitHub are gigantic uh, entities. Uh, and they both screwed up the same way in the same week. So is it a coincidence or is it a conspiracy? Who knows? It's actually very hard to sort that one out. And there's something called the 1848 effect. So if we have extra time, you can ask me about the 1848 effect. But it's why in any particular century, there's usually one very interesting year. It's actually a statistical property of uh, probability. So it's an inconvenient truth. You really have to be using uh, a different password on two different websites. It's crucial. OK. So you have to use a different password on every website. Uh, this is going to be a very serious problem. How are we going to take care of the usability? So I have 95 entries in my password safe and another three passwords memorized. So that's 98 passwords. And I don't think I'm so unusual. So the typical passwords you will find in my password safe look like that. They're machine generated, so they're uniformly drawn at random from uh, a, a set that includes essentially all of the printable ASCII characters. So can ordinary users remember 98 such passwords? Or even one, right? Uh, so you have to include uh, my 81-year-old mother. You have to include assorted eighth graders. You know, you have to include everybody. So it's a problem. So uh, now I'd actually like to take a break and, and invite you to go to this website. And what this website's going to do, it's going to ask you to enter an email address. Now, even email addresses are public. It works a little bit better if you enter an email address that's on the older side. And it will tell you whether or not your email address has been found in any of the major breaches. OK? So uh, and when I say major breaches, it includes even some that are sort of medium sized. So I realized just at this moment that I may have written this URL way too small. So I'm going to write it a little bit bigger. And I would uh, seriously encourage everybody in the room to actually do this. Uh, some of the other activities that I've put in the middle of the talk are a little less exciting. But uh, this one is very exciting. So, uh, and it's neat to put in email addresses that you know, uh, you've had for a little while. Uh, 11 times. OK, yeah. So you've been breached 11 times. That's, that's exciting. You know. uh, so we could maybe see. Can anybody beat 11? <laughs> yeah, they had problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yahoo had problems. Yeah. Actually, I mean, uh, if you're afraid of trusting this website, you could put my, my Yahoo in if you want, because that's public. I don't check this email address anymore. So if I register for something that I never want to receive an email about, I use this one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good idea to have one. Not everybody's in, in that situation. But now I should probably check. Yeah, my real one. Yeah. So of course, if it's a, an EDU, uh, you kind of you you might not know because if somebody hacks a university, it, it may not necessarily become public, right? So, uh, so, so did anybody beat eleven times? I'm just curious. No. 58 times for an America Online account. <laughs> yes, in the wow. back you were saying? Three was my AOL. Okay, only three. Okay, cool. Well, anyway, it's a neat trick. So if you ever need a conversation starter with your relatives, they ask you, well, what, what are you learning in school that's so useful? <laughs> now you have a conversation starter. So let's clear off some space and keep going. Okay. So then we'll see what we've got. All right. So password safes are pretty fun. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. So as, as we mentioned, you cannot memorize 98 passwords of this form, or maybe not even one. Uh, and so password safes can take care of the human memory problem. Uh, but then if, if a hacker penetrates your password safe, then all is lost. Uh, so <laughs> this is obviously a serious matter. So we need a good password, secure but easy to memorize, to secure entry to any password safe. And you can think of it as your master password. So now I'm going to risk destruction by actually showing you how it works. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to log into my university, because that's pretty harmless. 
So here is my password manager. It's PW Safe, uh, which was designed by Bruce Schneier. So he's a, a famous cryptologist. And it's been vetted by all sorts of um, you know, good computer programmers. Um, so here's my UW stat account. It's one of the many entries. As you can see, my password is hidden. So this takes care of shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is when uh, you're happily typing away at an airport. And behind you, somebody takes a photograph of you and zooms in afterward, right? Or they might uh, just look with their eyeballs. Or they might um, you know, uh, be walking behind you, because in airport, people are walking everywhere, right? And so you might not notice it. It happens. Um, so I'm going to copy the password, because the whole point is to not memorize them. And then uh, let's go to UW Stout. OK. So uh, whoops. Uh, we're very proud that 98.2% of our undergraduates have a job uh, within six months of graduation. So I always mention that everywhere we go. <laughs> and then my password is now paste. And then we have two-factor, because um, anything related to, to grades is ultra super vital important to be protected, because there's a law called FERPA. And now I've just touched the magic button on my phone, and now I'm in. Right? And so now we can see anything that we want to. So if you're curious about discrete mathematics, you can see all the things that I covered and you know, whatever it might be. OK, so that's how a password safe works. So your, your password forevermore will be paste. Um, so OK, now we go back to the slides, which are under this button, I hope. OK, cool. All right, and maximize. All right. OK, we did that. OK, so here's an XKCD, which I imagine that all of us have seen. right? Uh, so um, the common way that a lot of people do passwords is the worst of both worlds in two ways. They're hard for humans to remember and easy for computers to guess. So this is completely the opposite of what we should be doing. right? Uh, so um, you know, the human would be stressed out a little bit. Uh, as the, the human is scratching his or her head uh, all the way on the right. Um, and uh, for a computer, uh, it would be three, day, three days at 1,000 guesses per second. But actually, realistically, a million guesses per second is extremely possible. So that would be much less than three days, right? It would be three thousandths of a day. Uh, so now the uh, author of XKCD, Randall Monroe, he recommends you say uh, four random words chosen from a dictionary of 2,000 words. And um, uh, so he feels that at 1,000 guesses per second, this will take 550 years. In reality, again, a million guesses a second, so it's like six months. So it's not great. Uh, but that means that if somebody has 10 computers, it's 0.6 months, right? So we're not really at a cryptographic security level. Uh, but then it might be easy to remember it because you could uh, make a cartoon image. And if you remember the image, and humans are good at remembering images, you could remember that uh, um, you know, a, a horse is saying, that's a battery staple. And you say, correct. So correct horse battery staple. Uh, so this is actually pretty limited, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. So a passphrase is a phrase that you enter. Uh, and uh, so it's long, so you, you, you're going to press your fingers a few more times than you're used to. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to guess, and you don't have to worry about symbols and numbers and stuff like that. So yes? So what would be the entropy of that? Yeah. So in reality, entropy is an awesome thing to talk about. But it's talked about a little bit too often because it has a cool name. Uh, I would say that if this is really random, what we would do is we would look at the size of the all possible outputs. And uh, he's using a 2,000 word dictionary. Uh, and uh, then um, you've got four words. Uh, so 2,000 uh, is approximately 2 to the 11, um, because uh, 2 to the 11 is exactly 2048. But we have four words. So it's 2 to the 11 to the fourth power, which is 2 to the 44. That's the number of passwords that are possible. So we say that in computer science is 44-bit security. right? Then uh, up here, he's saying it's 28. So uh, going from here to here, you've gained a lot. Uh, it's better by a factor of 2 to the 18, which is um, 
257,000 something. Uh, let's file, hello computer. <laughs> um, so it's better, but it's, it's really not at what you would call a normal uh, security level. So let's see how good my arithmetic is. Okay, 262,000, not 257,000, but pretty close. Okay, so. Okay, so thank you for asking. Um, does anybody else want to ask a question at this time? Okie dokie. So some people will then take the correct horse battery stapler and turn it into CHBS and then add some numbers and some symbols, but this is really going into the, the, the wrong direction because the thing is now it's getting to the point where it's harder for the human to remember. Um, and then it's a little bit wasteful because if you take only the first letter of each phrase, and I know people who do this, all of these are turning out to be the same, right? And uh, you are, you're equivocating. So you're, you're taking your password space and you're making it way smaller. Because each of these would be CHBS, right? So it, it doesn't sound like that's a good idea. So instead of turning CHBS into CHBS, uh, or rather instead of turning correct horse battery stapler into CHBS, we just type in correct horse battery stapler uh, and it's a long password, so in, in spring of 2018, um, you know, the students, when they would see me log in at the start of class, they'd make fun of me for how long my password was, but that's okay. Um, and then also spelling can be an issue here because there's more words. Uh, and then there's another issue is that if there are too many words, then the ordering can be a problem, right? So uh, how do you remember the order in which to enter them? Okay. So now we're going to find out how good of a job the discrete math professor did. Uh, let's say that users are issued passwords that are randomly generated strings, always of length eight from uh, some alphabet set. So that's our first datum. And that uh, the attacker, so that is a typo, has access to a small computing cluster that can check uh, 10 million passwords per second. So this would be a cluster. I don't think your laptop can do it, but uh, it's, it's not so hard, I think. And then we're going to consider three different worlds of generating uh, generic classical passwords, so not passphrases. Uh, we're going to consider all 95 uh, printable ASCII characters. Capital letters, lowercases, and numerals it would be a different world. So you could think of this as world one. The, this is world two, where we allow capital letters, lowercase letters, and numerals. And this is world three, which is case insensitive. Uh, and uh, so you just have letters and numbers. And uh, what we want to know is, uh, uh, one, how many passwords are possible? So two, the time to brute force them. And then that's where you use this. And I recommend uh, scientific notation for seconds. And then uh, after that, make a human readable time. Because you can't use scientific notation when you talk to your boss's boss's boss. So why don't you just try this? Use any calculation tool that um, you might have handy. So if necessary, the calculator uh, applet in your uh, laptop. And let's figure out for these three worlds what these three things are. It should be pretty easy. So OK. So I'll go ahead and I'll give you a minute or so to, to perform the calculation. And then uh, I'll invite you to consult with your nearest neighbors to see if your answer agrees with theirs. And then uh, uh, after you have consulted and you feel confident, I will call upon people to share their answers. So let's uh, take a break and, and actually do that. Yeah. See you. All right, so are there any brave people uh, who want to tell me a little bit of what they got? And I'll give you a hint. The first row 
uh, probably is the one that uh, maybe is the, well, anyway, you can, you can tell me whatever you got for any of the nine positions. But uh, so does anybody want to tell me what they got? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, the, you were pointing at, uh, OK. Yeah. OK, well, you can give me a different spot if you want. Hmm? You can give me a different spot, whatever you, whatever you got. Uh, yeah, 1.97 times 10 to the 214 years. Uh, OK, so I, I don't believe I agree, but it's cool to try. So uh, maybe uh, we might invite someone to uh, give us a competing estimate. Uh, anyone? Any, any of the nine spots, the number of passwords, the number of seconds in scientific notation, or the, the human readable time. OK. OK, uh, that actually might be correct, uh, because I don't quite remember. The answer is on the next slide. Uh, does anybody want to give me these, or I mean, do you want me to just give you the answers? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if it was my math class, I would extract them from you. But yeah. So for word one, it's what ninety-five to the eight. Yep. Password. Mm -hmm. So, and then world two. Sixty-two to eight. Oh. Yes. And then uh, world three. Thirty-six. Yep. Yeah, that's not true. So then uh, your calculator will convert these to decimal. Don't try to do that in your head. But then to go from here to here, you just have to divide by 10 to the 7, which means you just take the exponent in scientific notation and you subtract 7. right? And then here, it depends what you get. Do you want to say it in hours, minutes, days? You have to uh, look at the number and, and decide uh, what is the most human readable. All right. So we have 95 to the 8. Uh, so in seconds, it's this much. And uh, that turns out to be 21 years, actually. Uh, so um, uh, not 10 to the 214 years, but that's OK. Uh, and then if you have capital letters, lowercase letters, and numerals, it's 62 to the 8. So notice, <laughs> again, um, this is the number that's just 62 to the 8. But then to adjust for the fact that we can do 10 to the 7 guesses per second, we go here, right? Uh, and then uh, that's 252 days and 17 hours. And then uh, for case insensitive with numerals, uh, we have, um, oh, that's my alarm going off. Pardon me. So this is very embarrassing. OK. Um, we have 36 to the 8th, which makes this many strings. We, we uh, reduce the exponent by seven decimal orders of magnitude, right? So from uh, 12 to 5, right? Uh, so it's that many seconds, and it turns out that's three days and uh, 6.36 hours. So let's now put this in a, a more analytical form. So when we talked about uh, you know, having letters and numerals only, if it's case insensitive, it's 3.26 days. If it's case sensitive, it's 252 days. These are really different, right? This is why your passwords are case sensitive, right? So that's why, if you're frustrated by that. And then uh, 252 days is this many years. So essentially 0.7 years versus 21 years, that's a big difference too. And that's why you have to use symbols. Now, this is with a 10 to the 7 guesses per second computing cluster. If the hacker has 10 times as much money, it will become two years and uh, 0.07 years, right? 25.2 days and a third of a day, right? So, you know, you have to scale it based on the financial resources of your adversary. So, if your adversary is a nation state, you have a very serious problem. It'd be interesting to com uh, combine this with the EC2 price per hour per yeah. compute unit and yeah. actually get a cost per password. OK, yes, yeah, so that's very interesting. Uh, so various services, right? So Amazon Web Services, the Google Cloud, they'll sell you computing power. Okay, uh, And then there's a cost associated with that. 
Uh, and so you could com com convert it to dollars. But uh, what I'll say is that um, uh, from Deschal, which actually happened my freshman year of, of college, I'm really old. Uh, so if you, if you look up the story of Deschal, Wikipedia has a nice article about it. There's also a book about it, which I think is overkill. Uh, that uh, this was a distributed computing attempt in 1995 in the very early days of uh, the World Wide Web, or mostly somewhat early days, uh, to break the data encryption standard, which is called DES, data encryption standard. Um, they did it with specialized hardware, and they blasted to pieces all of the estimates that were put together based on uh, a general purpose computer. Because a general purpose computer can do anything. It's Turing complete. That's actually a really strong statement. Right? Your, your general purpose computer can do anything that's computable. Uh, special purpose hardware can't. So one is tempted to assume that it would have a, a tremendous advantage. OK. Uh, so now I'm going to erase uh, some of the debris that we have up here about the math. Does anybody want to ask anything about the math? OK, cool. So that's how I'm going to do combinatorics in my uh, discrete book. And actually, that part is already written and has been classroom tested. So if any of you wish to brush up on your combinatorics, that's chapter three of, of my book. Um, so that's the nice thing about a, a Creative Commons type environment. If anybody asks me, well, how do you figure out this thing? Often I can just send them a URL and a page number. And then there it is. OK, cool. So uh, all right. So I mentioned that my passwords are computer generated, and, and yours should be too. So why is it bad if users can pick their own passwords? And there's a lot to talk about here. So you imagine the good old days, which never really existed, when you could have a password made up entirely of letters alone and it was secure. Why do I say never really existed? Because in the day that we would be talking about, you were limited to eight characters anyway. So 26 to the eight or 52 to the eight is very limited, very small, right? So um, uh, you never really had the freedom to have arbitrarily long passwords in an era when you would dare do it with alphabetic characters. But anyway, uh, are you equally likely to pick this random sequence of letters as you are to pick that phrase? I don't think so. Right? So humans do not select strings of characters uniformly at random. We simply don't do that. So people do research on this point. So one of them is you, you go to a website and you just enter 0 and 1 as arbitrarily as you can, faking being a random number generator. And there's a little neural network, or maybe it's Burlicamp Massey. Something's running in the background. And after about 30 or 40 bits, it begins to predict you with alarming frequency. Right? So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, then also, if you try to pick words randomly, nouns are the overwhelming majority of what you're going to pick, unless you know that ahead of time. Uh, and uh, if you don't believe me, try it. Uh, generate 100 random words and uh, arbitrary words, and just see how many of them are nouns. Um, and you know, I mean, that's uh, an example of a non-uniformity, because most words in the English language are not nouns. So I actually need equally likely for the correctness of my security calculations and that actually ends the conversation. But um, using some math that used to be widely taught, um, you could use Markov chains. Uh, OK, now that makes sense. Um, to produce sequences of symbols that are typical in a given probability distribution, regardless of the distribution, so long as the distribution is known. So uh, if you have a really lopsided distribution, we can still fake simulate that distribution. But uh, we only need to know the distribution. So you can make something that will guess the most likely passwords and somewhat likely passwords, but bypassing the vast majority of the passwords that are actually not very likely. And that's the um, asymptotic equipartition property, which was in a 600 level information theory course that I actually took twice. Uh, so uh, and this was the one thing I never fully understood. But uh, I can point you to references if you're, if you're curious about why this works on the theoretical side. But on the practical side, I've coded it up many times uh, just to make random arbitrary Spanish or random arbitrary English or uh, random arbitrary numerical sequences or something like that. Uh, so um, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Okay. 
So now, just to, to cheer us up a little bit, uh, so now the comma is not in the right place. <laughs> of all comma time. OK. Um, I'm going to tell you about my favorite hack of all time. And it's a little bit Wisconsin specific, but not really. I think you'll get the idea. Has anybody ever heard of the Green Bay Packers? Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a football team of enormous importance to the citizens of Wisconsin. Okay? So very, very famous. And Green Bay is a fairly big town. I mean, it's actually a city of, of, of some size, as it turns out. And there's a UW Green Bay there. So uh, we have a campus of the University of Wisconsin system up there. So let's say you want to target UW Green Bay and you want to get into their intranet. And you just saw what the UW authentication system is like, right? So surely someone who is an undergraduate at that campus has this as their password. Maybe 10 people do. I don't know how many. But surely the number of people who have this as their password must be greater than 0, right? It's probably a lot greater than 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try every possible username, right? So you assume that you can get some sort of list of all the usernames. And for each one, I shall try to log in only once using this password. And since I make at most one incorrect entry per user, nobody gets locked out. So they won't even be alerted that I'm attacking. And the probability that zero students out of 8,443 students, thank you, Wikipedia, have the same password, or, or, or um, the, the probability that nobody has this password out of that many students, that's infinitesimal. Surely someone has it, right? So this is my favorite hack of all time. And this is social engineering. So that uh, you know, if, you, if you know something about uh, a place, you can attack it much better than uh, just talking about security technologies in isolation in some you know, textbook chapter or something like that. OK, is a good time to pause for questions? Is, are there any? Yeah, so I, I understand Have I Been Owned actually has a service where they provide password lists of common passwords to yeah. look into your system. So if you try and use Go Packers, yeah. it will say, no, you can't use this password. It's, it's too common. OK, so at Tulane, I was uh, um, uh, hanging out in New Orleans for several months because Wisconsin is cold and I'm on sabbatical. Uh, so I decided to join the gym at Tulane. And as I was doing that process, I have to give my credit card number and all of that, uh, the student had to log into a slightly better uh, account that can handle the, the um, credit cards, right? Make sure that it makes sense that should be password protected. And so one student said to another, um, I forgot my password. Can I just use yours? So she slowly dictated, the coworker slowly dictated the username, and then said the password's just password. Mm. So being me, I immediately emailed the IT people. So mm -hmm. it took uh, maybe a minute to find the email address of the head of the, the you know, computer services. And I spelled everything out, including the time in which desk it was. OK? So later, I saw that same person again. So they didn't get fired. <laughs> and if you're going to ban one password, you're going to ban the word password. <laughs> OK. So I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, your, your question is a very valid one, OK? So uh, it just seems like a very simple Yeah. So at Stout, we have it. If, if, you, if you have a monstrously stupid password, it'll say, no, please enter a different one. Uh, so uh, uh, at Stout, we, we do it. But um, I mean, uh, uh, it's really unwise to store passwords in plain text. Twitter did it. GitHub did it. So yeah. Uh, I guess what it really comes down to is that uh, people don't care as much about computer security as they tell us they do. Because if they did, they would block those monstrously idiotic passwords. So that's an outstanding question. There was another hand somewhere? Oh. Yeah. Did you say you actually did that on campus? Uh, no, I've never executed the Go Packers hack. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the, the Tulane student having the password password, I did actually report that one. That actually happened. 
Uh, but the, the Go Packers, I'm pretty sure that this would work. But um, it's unlawful uh, to attempt to access the emails or files, potentially. But especially the information of whichever user was dumb enough to have that password. So it's important not to violate that person's privacy. Yes? Would it be unlawful to, for IT to look in an active directory? Um, or, ooh, or it's a very it? wise question. <laughs> you wouldn't have to try to access their account if not. you are an administrator. You can just check it against the hash table. Yeah. yeah. Well, an active directory. There wouldn't have to be a login if somebody stored is plain. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is really interesting stuff. Let's say you use your birth date as part of your password. Birth dates are protected information, right? So but just it may be tricky. You're not you're not 100 percent sure it's their birth date. You don't necessarily know. Yeah. You just make it up. Yeah, I don't know. I would say that these are very interesting questions. Um, the law is bizarre. Okay, uh, with the cameras off, I'll tell you a really bizarre story about <laughs> universities and law. Uh, so it's very hard to to really uh, predict what the law would say. Uh, you ask five lawyers, you get five different answers. So that's why, actually, uh, very large companies have a large number of lawyers. So that they'll intersect what each one says is legal, or take the, the union of what each of them says is prohibited. See, there's discrete math everywhere. I mean, it's the key to everything. OK. Uh, so actually, we're going to get um, into the difficult part now. So if you want to ask anything, it's a good time. OK. So distance metrics are a, a piece of discrete mathematics. Well, it's actually not discrete. It's a piece of mathematics. You could do it in a discrete math class. It's not that hard, but nobody does that, so far as I know. So uh, typically, you will see it in a 400-level math class called analysis, but that's late, and only a math major or a CS major who's double majoring in math would see it. So this thing actually probably should be in discrete. Uh, so I'm going to put it in my discrete book, but I haven't written that part yet. Uh, and I'm not sure I would ever actually reach it during the semester. So the fact that I'm adding it to my book is not necessarily informative. Uh, so I want you to imagine that you have a favorite class. So notice these are the same. And we're going to make a, a method that takes these two uh, um, uh, items, both of which are members of your favorite class, as inputs. And what we're going to output is a float or a double, but precision really won't matter, as it turns out. Uh, so this is basically what we're talking about when we talk about an abstract distance metric. You have some sort of set uh, or class of objects. And uh, the two are the same, yeah. So you take two of them, and you put them into this thing, and a real number pops out. But not everything of that form uh, will qualify. So uh, S is your favorite class. And we're going to have a function that takes two inputs from S and outputs a real number. So these are the rules. It's just simply never negative. There's nothing you could put in to make it negative. Never negative. Separable, what this means is that if you put the same thing in twice, so if you say, what's the distance from A to A, it will say 0. If you put in two different things, no matter what it says, it cannot say 0. Right? So if it, you give the same input twice, it's going to respond 0. You give it two different inputs, it's going to say something that's not 0. And then the symmetry. If you say, what's the distance from A to B, and what's the distance from B to A, you have to have the same answer. So you can interchange the order of the inputs. So, and then there's the triangle inequality, which turns out to be crucial, but uh, um, I don't want to really emphasize it in the slides. Uh, but uh, the proof that is at the heart of my speller error tolerant password scheme does involve the triangle inequality intimately. But I imagine that the proof is a PDF file that zero or one of you will actually open. I mean, it's just not of a CS person's interest. It's a math major interest, right? So it's cool. Um, OK. There's a technical point. We have 1A, 1B, 2, and 3. Why did I number the four things this way? Uh, if you actually have these three, you can prove that one. Uh, OK. But 
Uh, what that means is if you look up abstract distance metrics on one website, it'll say three axioms. You look it up on another website, it'll say four. So you might be irritated by that. But in reality, uh, one A and one B, you only need really the one B. You don't really need the one A. OK. So as I said, uh, this is part of the theory of uh, metrizable spaces or the theory of abstract distance metrics. Uh, so if you take a topology course, it's in there. If you take a real analysis, too, it will be in there. Uh, so in Israel, for example, at the Technion, computer scientists do study topology. Uh, maybe that's just hazing. I don't know. But uh, I know it's true. Or at least it was true last time I asked. Um, the details were worked out by uh, Maurice Frechet. Uh, Frechet? Fresh, maybe? I don't know. Uh, so our, our professor of French has left, so I can relax. And I can mispronounce it as badly as I like. Um, so he lived a long time ago, as you can see. And uh, his paper uh, was published in 1906. So uh, this has been around for a little bit of a, of a time. Uh, and he was looking at the worst case error when one function wants to approximate another function. So uh, that was the original use, and ours is completely different. So the first example of an abstract distance metric is an ordinary Euclidean distance, just the distance between two points. Uh, so there's the good old distance formula in 3D. Uh, if you are 2D, you just take a pair of scissors and cut it here. Uh, so it works really well. Or you could just say all the z coordinates are 0. Uh, so there's no way you can get a negative number out because you're taking a square root. Uh, then the only way that this can, can become 0 is if the two points are the same. That's already non-trivial to prove, but we're in computer science. So we're not going to try to prove anything. Uh, then uh, it is symmetric. So if you reverse this, or if you reverse this, or if you reverse this, or if you reverse all of them, or uh, two and not the other, uh, you're squaring the thing. So uh, the sign is uh, destroyed. Uh, positive or negative are the same after squaring. So uh, it's definitely symmetric. That's clear. And then um, the triangle inequality will always hold. This is basically saying that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And uh, the only way you can get equality, actually, is if S2 is the midpoint of S1 and S3. So like, in a math class, this would be there would be a lot of fun things to talk about. So the Manhattan distance, which is also called the taxicab distance, let's say I'm at 6th Street and 2nd Avenue, and I need to go to 24th Street and 10th Avenue. You cannot walk through buildings, right? So as a pedestrian, you can walk. It's like graph paper. All the addresses are the intersections. And you can walk on the edges of the boxes, but you can't walk through the white part, right? So you cannot walk through a building. Uh, and actually, in Manhattan, this is true, that usually there's security at each of the entrances of a multi-entrance building. And so if you don't have an appointment when somebody works in that building, they're not going to let you in. Uh, so this is uh, an addition of two absolute values. There's no way either of them could output a negative number individually, so their sum cannot be negative. You can switch the order. It's absolute value. It doesn't care. Um, and then uh, the triangle inequality holds. And it turns out this is not difficult to prove, but it's annoying. It's long, so skip it. OK. Now, uh, when I talk about graphs, it's always important to know what we're talking about. So uh, oftentimes, when I uh, uh, talk about graphs, my audience will assume that because I'm a math person, that I'm talking about graphing uh, y equal x squared. No. I'm talking about this type of graph, which surely you've all seen at some point in data structures or in uh, discrete math. So let's say you have a nice yummy graph. Um, there's actually two metrics that are of vital importance that you can put on this uh, object. Uh, one of them is called the Dijkstra distance or the MapQuest uh, metric. Uh, so it's uh, uh, used in an undirected, so no one-way streets, edge-weighted graph. So the edges have weights, but the vertices don't. And it's the sum of the weights on the edges of the lowest weight path from V1 to V2. Uh, so uh, we also have to say that all the weights are positive. So if I didn't put that, it's missing. It should be right here. Uh, if, uh, if we don't have that, then this could be violated. If you take two adjacent vertices on either end of a negative weight edge, then you'd have a negative distance, right? So we, we cannot do that. Uh, it is symmetric because we said it's an undirected graph, so we, we forced that one. Uh, the only way it's going to be 0, so all the weights have to be positive. Uh, the only way it's going to be 0 is if you say, what's this is from B to B. Right, okay. And then the triangle inequality also holds. Uh, but that one, uh, you know, I've never thought about why that's true. But it, you can, th yeah, that's interesting. Um, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I know why it's true. Because it's the lowest weight path from V1 to V2. So if it was really the case that it is lower cost to go from S1 to S2 and then S2 to S3, then going from S1 to S3 directly, then that would not be the lowest weight path, right? So it means that Dijkstra's algorithm in some way, uh, Dijkstra was drunk and the algorithm malfunctioned. Okay. Then you can have the hop count distance where we say, okay, I'm ignoring the weights, right? How many edges? That's it, right? Uh, so this actually comes up uh, in experimental design. You can ask me if you're curious why. And then um, uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, distance zero would be a vertex to itself. If you're not the same vertex, if you can get there, surely you have to navigate over some uh, of the edges. And all of the edges are weight one. So there's no way you can get a negative number. Uh, and it's symmetric because it's an undirected graph. OK. Um, this is the most boring one, uh, the real numbers, where you take the absolute value of the difference. It, it hits all the axioms, but uh, it's boring. And then uh, the same dis difference, distance metric, or the discrete metric. So uh, you can do this on any set S. Uh, if you ask me about the same object twice, I say 0. And if you put in two different inputs, I say 1. Uh, and it turns out that it hits all of the, the axioms. It only can output 0 or 1, so it's never going to output something negative. Uh, well, we forced this one. And then uh, if you reverse the, the inputs, uh, it doesn't care. And then uh, the triangle inequality, uh, you can try all of the different possibilities for S1, S2, and S3, and you'll see that it, it, it does hold. OK. So the damerau levenstein string edit distance metric is the one that I used in my research. And it turns out that this is something really cool. It explains how spell checkers work. It comes up in DNA. And if you just say, I'm going to take the code, hope it works, and I don't care how, then you can definitely understand it without too much effort. And uh, honestly, that's the way pretty much people view these things. Uh, they just want to know what it does, and they don't really care how it does it. So this is what powers the spell checkers, which is why we need it to do the spelling error correction. Um, Autocorrect on your phone. Automated, automatic uh, plagiarism detectors also use this. It comes up in the digital humanities. So if they have two different versions of Homer, uh, they can figure out, or if they have 10 different versions of Homer, they can figure out which one was a copy of which others by looking at the, because the, the scribe is going to make errors once in a while, even if they're very few. You can then see, all right, these two are really similar, and these two are really similar, but these two are different, you know, stuff like that. Um, OK, so this is one of those things that's super important in industry, not taught in any undergraduate curriculum that I've ever seen in the USA. Um, and in graduate school, they always assume that you already know it, or they just give you a citation and they say, go read it. This, we do this a lot in math, that there's a lot of things that are not in any undergraduate curriculum I've ever seen, like the projective geometry. And then when you get to grad school, if you, if you say you don't know it, they're like, how did you get in? So it's really a problem, actually. Uh, OK. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at strings that are from an alphabet. You can think of it as the English alphabet. Uh, or you can include numerals and symbols if you want or not. Um, so we're going to define 1 as the transposition of two characters, a deletion of a character, an insertion of a character, or the substitution of one character with another. So if I take the word character and I vaporize one of the letters, that's distance 1. If I insert a letter that has no business being there, that's also distance 1. If I interchange two adjacent letters, that's distance 1. And then if I just arbitrarily put an i instead of an h there, that's distance 1. Now there's a slight flaw here that the z key and the p key are really far apart. And if I replace a z with a p, it would still be distance 1. So the probability of replacing a z with a p is very low. So it's not a wonderful model of human behavior when it comes to spelling errors, but it's very effective in, in practice. So again, we define 1 because we're defining a unit of measure. So 0 means the two strings are the same. And a 1 means that we did one of these four things. We interchanged two adjacent characters. We just vaporized a character. We inserted a character that had no business being there. Or we did a replacement of one character with another. And now the distance between two words is the smallest number of one error moves that can change one word into another. So if we do some examples, it'll become much clearer. 
So back in cat uh, can be thought of as two moves, delete the b and then insert the c, or one move, substitute the b with a c, so that's distance one. Rat to cats, you could delete the r, uh, no, you could replace the r with a c and insert an s, that's two. Or you could do it with three moves. You insert uh, the, um, you delete the r first, you insert the s at the end, and then you delete the c at the start. But we always want the smallest possible number of moves, so we're going to consider this two, right? So uh, replacing the r with a c and gluing the s on the end is two. Whereas here, this is only one because we replaced the b with a c. So now united and untied is actually distance one because believe it or not, if you interchange those two letters in the middle, you change one word to the other, which is kind of funny because they have the opposite meaning. Glory to heaps, which is something that maybe a data, data structures professor would say, uh, this is distance five because the letters are totally unrelated. So you'd have to replace the G with an H, the L with an E, the O with an A, the R with a P, and the Y with an S. Okay? And then this is polynomially time computable, which is shocking. And I give the code in C at the back of the paper, which I think may have been critical for this paper taking off. So I just say, all right, here's the code. It's in C, and it works. And uh, so that means that, uh, well, you don't actually have to understand why it's polynomially time computable or how the code works. And actually, I'll, I'll be 100% honest, I don't remember how it works. But it's there. And so it doesn't go bad, it doesn't spoil. Uh, OK. So actually, this is a good time to take questions. And if there are none, that's also OK. OK. So now we're going to stress your discrete math skills. Uh, this isn't about the damer levenstein distance metric. We're going back to, to past phrases now. So let's say I have a dictionary of 3,000 really common words. So I have a set of words of size 3,000. And then my past phrases are going to consist of five words, which as it turns out is too small, but it's OK, right? So how many sequences of five words are possible using only words from this dictionary? So now by sequences, I mean you can repeat words if you want to, and order matters. So in a sequence, the order is, is part of the fun. But then question two, how many subsets of five words are possible using only words from this dictionary? And the key here is the word subset. So uh, it really does need to be a subset. Uh, so are you allowed to repeat things when you make a subset? Does order matter in a subset? So those are some questions you might want to think of when you're, when you're computing the answer to question two. So give it a try, and let's see how it goes. And again, uh, you'll never see me uh, again, so if you get it wrong, there's no harm, right? So it's a very low stress environment. So here's another one to cheer you up a little bit. So you imagine some space aliens that use octal because they're evolved from octopi. OK, so their 31 is what in our system of numbers. And this might seem like it's totally lame, but there's actually a point. Um, so you can think about this one as well. Maybe it doesn't take too much time. Uh, so uh, this time, share with your neighbors, and let's see how you did. So share with each other to confirm and build your confidence on your answer. Can repeat words. And you can feel free to get up if you need to compare with somebody seated a little further away. Come on, this, this is systems too. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's a very interesting point. We use hexadecimal and binary very often. Yes. 
So back when I was studying for computer engineering, it was a challenge. I only did it for a month. The challenge was to do it for a semester to balance your checkbook entirely in hexadecimal. Ooh. Now, you had to balance your checkbook at that time because uh, the idea of a bank having its own website in 1996, not happening, <laughs> not happening. Uh, so uh, you, you couldn't avoid balancing your checkbook, but instead of doing it in decimal, do it in hex. Um, so you get to practice hexadecimal subtraction. So uh, we, we did make uh, one a penny instead of a dollar. Very important, otherwise it, it's much worse. Uh, so, but it's, it's a good exercise, you know. If I were teaching computer architecture, I might give you a series of financial transactions and ask you to reproduce the ledger in hexadecimal. Uh, okay, so uh, is there a brave soul who can answer uh, question one or can offer an answer to question one? So uh, what'd you get? Yes, you are correct, because uh, 243 is um, 3 to the 5th, and um, 1,000 to the 5th is 10 to the 15, and then we have to move the decimal place 2, so that gets us to the 17th power. But I think also most people would just say, hello, calculator, I love you, tell me this thing, uh, which, which is totally okay. Uh, all right, question two, anybody? It's okay if you didn't get it, but if you got it, I'd love to know. Subsets. No, it's not the factorial. And the, there's actually something very interesting there. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll mention why in a minute. That's interesting. but Which this would be god awful large. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Uh, you know, in crypto, we're, we're, we're happy with large numbers. But um, okay. So I'll go on to the next slide that has the answers now. Uh, so um, there's a standard grid when you're learning about combinatorics that has the exponent principle, permutation principle, and combinations principle in it. Uh, so we correctly nailed that the first one is the exponent principle. Uh, the question two is combinations principle. So whenever you think about subsets, it's the combinations principle. Uh, so some people write it this way, some people write it this way, but that's the number. Uh, so one thing is that um, every subset is a sequence, but there are sequences that are not subsets because you cannot repeat in a subset, right? And then also the order doesn't matter in a subset, but in a sequence the order matters. So this number definitely has to be smaller than this number, whereas 3,000 factorial is enormous. One of the things I've noticed about teaching discrete mathematics, and I, I've taught it actually seven times, is that uh, people love the factorial symbol because exclamation points usually are associated with happy words or ouch, but uh, often with happy words. And uh, so out of the, the principles of combinatorics, and it depends how your book slices it up, but in mine there are seven. So you've got the multiplication principle, the exponent principle, permutations principle, uh, then factorial principle, uh, the um, uh, complement principle, the combinations principle, and the handshake principle. Some people consider handshake to be a subset of combinations, and some people consider factorial to be a subset of, of permutations. So uh, it depends how your book was written, how many different principles there are. But the factorial principle is the one that's actually used the least, but it's guessed the most. <coughs> but if you're really desperate and you have to take an exam in combinatorics, uh, so uh, yeah, I won't. OK, there's a place I used to work where there is such an exam. And all employees, when they apply, they have to pass it, um, all technical employees. Uh, you know, one of the things you should do is guess combinations, because this is usually uh, much more likely than the other principles. Of course, it's better to think and to get the right answer. But if you're desperate, uh, you know, combinations is the most commonly used. Um, OK, so this one is considerably easier. What did we get? Anybody? 25. 25. So it seems like this has nothing to do with anything. But actually, this is the reason that computer engineers cannot tell the difference between Halloween and Christmas because oct um, uh, 31 is deck 25. So this is why computer engineers cannot tell the difference between Halloween and Christmas. <laughs> Okay, tough room. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. 
Okay. Um, octal space aliens come up a lot in my thinking uh, for different reasons. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, we've got uh, um, the, the number that we just analyzed. So the idea is the number of words in the passphrase dictionary is this, and then um, this is uh, how long the passphrase is. If we're going to make it reorder tolerant, so you can put them in any order, and you still are successfully able to log in, uh, we need to use the combinations operator. Um, but the thing is that, as it turns out, this number is not really big enough, uh, but that's how many guesses would be required. So this is going to be uh, 6.4 years on our hacker, who has a cluster that can do 10 to the 7 guesses per second, like we had earlier. Uh, but you spend 10 times as much money, and now you're 10 to the 8 guesses per second, and that would be half a year. So we, we need to do a little bit better. We're, we're in the ballpark, but we need to do a little bit better. So trying again, let's say it's a seven word passphrase, and it's, uh, which isn't so bad, right? So when I was growing up uh, in elementary school, phone numbers were seven digits. So it's actually kind of a nice pattern length for memorization. And you have 9,500 words in the dictionary. Uh, now you get a, a larger number. You've got an exponent uh, of 10 to the 24. And so at 10 to the 7 per second, this is what you get. Uh, and that's um, actually uh, you know, a really long time. Uh, and then uh, so we have 4.38 billion years. Uh, at approximately 5 billion years, but it's an estimate, the sun will enter its red giant phase, and the radius of the sun will be larger than the orbit of Mars. So we'll be really warm. <laughs> so uh, this will cheer up my, my colleagues in Wisconsin, because when I left Wisconsin a few days ago, we had shoulder height snow. Right? So uh, they, they will look forward to the day when the Earth is inside the sun. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, if the hacker were to buy one million computing clusters uh, of the 10 to the 7 variety, uh, it's still a really large number of years to be able to read your email. So, you know, this is approximately the range that you would want the numbers to be in. Uh, and this, this analysis is called actually uh, determining the security level. Uh, so there are all sorts of situations in crypto where you have to do computations of this type. So now we're going to marry the two concepts and talk about spelling error and reorder tolerant passphrases. Um, is there a question before we get into this? It's always good to ask questions. Okay. So when you instantiate my password scheme, you first pick a security level. So 80, I think, makes a lot of sense for many applications. 128 if you're uh, paranoid and you want to annoy your users. Or you could go higher if you wanted. Um, so what's a security level? Okay. So let's say you have the advanced encryption standard, and you're using it to encrypt your messages. And you're using the version of it called AES-256. Your secret key is 256 bits long. So that's security level 256, because it would take a really, really long time to guess all possible 2 to the 256 keys. If you're using the data encryption standard, your key is 56 bits long. So you'd have a 56-bit security level, right? Because it would be 2 to the 56 uh, possible keys. So basically, we're taking the number of things that the hacker has to try, and we're writing it as 2 to the junk, where the junk doesn't have to be an integer. It also could be a, a real number. That's what it really comes down to. Uh, so when we say security level, 128-bit security means there's 2 to the 128 things to guess, and 80-bit security means there's 2 to, the 80 bit, uh, 2 to the 80 things to guess. So from what we just did, we got this number for 3,000 words in the dictionary and passwords of length 5, which is about 2 to the 51. It's a little bit less. And for 95, that should be 9,500, so that's a big typo. So slide 66, we'll have to change that one. OK. And uh, passphrases of length 7, we got this number when we did our analysis again. And that's actually OK, right? Well, this is what we got. We got something times 10 to the 24th power. Um, and 80.2 uh, bits of security uh, is probably OK for many applications. So this is what it means when we talk about a security level. So now you remember the XKCD uh, cartoon entitled Correct Horse Battery Staple. 
Uh, they had a 2,000 word dictionary in four words. So uh, yeah, it's actually 43.8 bits of security. They said 44. Uh, so they just rounded, which is fine. I rounded too. Um, but uh, this is actually a problem. It's not enough. Because uh, if you do this uh, with a 10 to the 7 um, uh, guesses per second, you're going to have uh, 1.6 times 10 to the 7. Ah, uh, uh, no, 10 to the 6. So it's actually even worse than this. Yeah, it's even worse than this. Uh, let's uh, be a little bit careful here. I have a calculator on my laptop. So if we take 2,000 to the fourth power, right? it's that. We divide it by 10 to the 7 guesses a second. It's that. And then we divide it by 3,600. It's that many hours. And we divide it by 24. Yeah, it's 18.5 days. So um, let's lower that uh, calculator a little bit so that it's visible to the camera. So um, yeah, so it's actually 18 and a half days, uh, which is horrible, right? I mean, that's, that's too easy. So OK. So this is slide 67. So when I um, give the PDF file to be uploaded to Moodle for you, these typos will be fixed. I'm recording these, by the way. Oh, good. So then I don't need to write it down. OK. I don't know why I'm still writing it down after saying that. <laughs> OK. So all right. Yeah, sorry about this. It happens. It's life. Uh, OK. So you can pick a security level. Uh, and if you get a passphrase handed to you, um, after you pick your security level, what it is is there's this dictionary of words D. You get n words taken from there. So uh, you know five to nine words. Uh, this would be fixed in advance in order to make the security level calculations come out nice. And now the surprising part, and this is what has to be explained in the remaining slides, you can make zero, one, or two spelling errors per word in the phrase. You can enter the words in any order whatsoever, but you cannot save up the spelling errors and mutilate like one of the words, you know, a lot, right? So um, uh, it really is zero, one, or two spelling errors per word. So uh, just generalizing our previous calculation, the size of the dictionary choose n. That's the number of possible passphrases or number of subsets. And if you represent that as two to the l, then l is your security level. L does not have to be an integer. It could be a, a real number. So the user is going to enter this passphrase. What we're going to do, my set D is not an arbitrary set of 3,000 words or 9,500 words. It's not the most common 3,000 words and the most common 9,500 words. It's just the words have been chosen so that for any two distinct words in the dictionary, the distance between them is five or more. Okay. So what it is is that you pick any two words, as long as you don't pick the same one, you put it into the damer levinstein distance metric, and it gives you an answer that's five or greater. And my claim, which requires a proof, and the proof is a one-page PDF file, and in reality it's, it should be a half a page or a third of a page, but I decided to show all the steps. Um, so for any word in the dictionary, oh, for any word in the dictionary or not, there is at most one word in the dictionary such that the distance is less than or equal to two. So this claim is a little bit amazing. So if you obey this rule on the construction of the, of the dictionary, then I'm promising that whatever you enter, whether it's a word in the dictionary or gibberish, there is at most one word in the dictionary that is distance uh, zero, one, or two away. So this is uh, surprising and it requires a proof. Uh, and Proof is just a PDF file, so you can look at it later. Uh, and then for each of the possibly misspelled words WT typed by the user, since there is at most one word in the dictionary that has distance less than or equal to two, we just replace what they typed with that word. So the user comes to the keyboard. They uh, enter uh, some words which are possibly misspelled. And then since there is a unique word where the distance is less than or equal to 2, we're going to replace each thing they type with that unique word. Then we alphabetize the, correctly, uh, the spell corrected words. 
And then lastly, we hash them. You don't really need salt. And compare them to our normal database of hashed passwords. Um, and if it's right, it's right. And if it's wrong, you, you don't let the user log in. So you really do have to do spelling correction first and alphabetization second. And the reason is if you misspell flight versus vlight, right, you really want to correct it back to flight before you alphabetize. Otherwise, it will be in the wrong spot. And then the hash function will give it the wrong digest, and the user won't get it. Right? So the order is, is important. You have to alphabetize first, or you have to spelling correct first and alphabetize second. If you alphabetized first and spelling corrected second, the scheme would not work. OK, let's do an example. So uh, the example is to be done with a pen. So uh, if the password is actually, let's say the first two words are uh, rats and then uh, stink, right? Uh, and you, you enter sink, OK? Uh, then let's say that cat is in the dictionary but rats isn't, uh, and that maybe stink is in the dictionary, but sink isn't, it would first do uh, the uh, spelling uh, cor uh, correction, and then it would alphabetize them. So in this case, the order didn't change. Uh, and then it would dump it into a hash function. And then the digest either matches the, the digest that was stored when your passphrase was generated, or it doesn't. OK. So now uh, we can talk about uh, a high security version of it. So we have, uh, let's say, uh, 79,267 words. I pick nine of them uniformly at random without repeats. I give them to you. They become your password. Order doesn't matter. And then uh, what we would get is that there are this many possible passphrases. You can't run a for loop through all of them. Uh, you would have. Uh, 2 to the 128 security. Um, so this is like breaking a 128-bit a uh, block cipher, uh, which we assume is totally, totally out of the question. So I think slide 72 was meant to be earlier. I apologize for that strangeness that it seems to be located in the wrong place. I don't know how that happened. OK. Now, for those of you who are really experts on discrete mathematics, you might remember that there's something called the generalized birthday paradox. In this case, even the generalized birthday paradox will not save an attacker because this is such an enormous number that when I square root it, I get this thing. So there's only uh, 7.8 billion people on the planet, so less than 8 billion people on the planet. What this means is that since the number of users of your website is at most the population of the Earth, okay, uh, if each one of them gets issued a, a random passphrase, the probability that the same passphrase gets issued to two different people by coincidence is this. Really, that's okay. Okay. So now there's one more feature I'd like to mention. Anybody want to ask anything? OK, the idea of a duress password. So muggings occur with alarming frequencies in cities and even in medium-sized towns. Uh, it happened to me several times, uh, depending on how you count. Uh, so twice I was held at gunpoint, once baseball bat point, once strong arm. And maybe there was another time where you might consider it a mugging. Uh, so I had bad luck. I think it's statistically anomalous. But definitely, you have to be aware that muggings happen. So there was another case where an NSA cryptologist, not me, uh, his credentials, so his badge, and his PIN were forced from him at gunpoint in Baltimore. But they let him keep his wallet. Hmm. OK. So in places like Haiti, kidnappings are very common. And tourists are often held for ransom. Uh, and unfortunately, so are aid workers. Uh, so in these situations, is it wise to have a duress password? So the way that this works is you get one extra word selected uniformly at random from the special dictionary, but it's not your normal passphrase word. So in addition to the n words that are part of your passphrase that you normally use, there's this extra word. 
And in all probability, every user gets a different duress word. Well, not exactly. It depends on the size of the dictionary. So, so, so this bullet is a little fuzzy. Uh, but any time that someone's pointing a gun at you and telling you to log in, what you do is you replace one of the words in your passphrase with um, the duress word, and you type the other n minus one words normally. So then the system is alerted that you're uh, being held uh, at uh, gunpoint. So now how should the system respond? This is incredibly unclear, actually. right? So uh, maybe it should behave as normal so that the criminal thinks that you've logged in as normal, but that police cars are routed to your location or something like that. You know? so, so how should the system respond? This is something that would depend on the context. If it's a bank, for sure, let the criminal do whatever they want. Because the bank has an insurance policy that covers that. It's the insurance company's problem. right? And then the insurance company would probably agree because the wrongful death suit would be way more expensive than the transaction at the ATM. Right? So uh, if it's a national security issue, eh, this is complicated. right? So this is for someone else to work out. But you could put a duress password into the scheme. So it would have to be a different word for each user because if it was danger or something like that, that would give away that something is up. So now, after any big research project, it's always nice to look at what are the life lessons that I learned from the research project. These are totally non-technical. So I did this research in 06, and I published it in 08. Because the math in it was all stuff that could be found in a good 200-level discrete math course, except abstract distance metrics would be in a 400-level course. And because I was going for a PhD in applied mathematics, I thought that this was a very minor paper. It wasn't even a B paper. It was like a, you know, a C paper. So I simply published it unencumbered, so no patents. Uh, and then the first question is, that people ask me is, did it get implemented? It did not get literally implemented. It's not like somebody out there said, OK, we're going to take the password scheme in this paper, and we're going to use it for our operating system. No, that never happened. But it you know, was cited by other researchers and cited by other researchers. And indirectly, it wormed its way through the world of, of password security and usability. Okay, So you can do something called bibliography hopping to, to track this. And then also, when you go up for things like tenure and promotion as a professor, one of the things you do is you look at your citation count. So this paper, which I thought was a minor paper, actually ended up being my fourth most cited paper. So I wrote one book about the data encryption standard that said 200 citations. Then Algebraic Cryptanalysis, a book that took multiple years of my life, is at 169. A paper about how to break the block cipher that was used to safeguard automobiles from the 80s until about 05. That was 144 citations. Then what we just talked about today is 90. An attack on SSL was 60. Right? So this is very weird. Uh, and then uh, there's a really uh, bizarre but interesting cryptanalysis paper that got 54. Um, and then uh, this is more of a, a similar attack on SSL, got 51. My PhD dissertation, which took multiple years of my life, is only 48. Uh, I also like computer algebra. This is the best I've ever done over there. And then uh, again, computer algebra. And then my book on Sage, which is free, only has 27 academic citations. But lots of people are downloading it. I can see that my website has some analytics tools, so I'm happy about it. But only 27 people are bothering to cite it, but that's my problem. And then uh, again, Keylock. So it's actually kind of funny. I mean, you know, some of the things on here were multiple years, and they're 20-something. And this damn password scheme made it to 90. So it's very bizarre. But it's good to give away things for free, because if I had ever encumbered this thing with patents, there's no way other researchers would have touched it. Because just the cost of a patent lawyer is so expensive that if anybody sees any patents attached to an algorithm or a piece of software, unless their company is very rich, they're just going to say, no, let's not go near it. Then I did uh, put at the end of the paper the C code for computing the damer levinstein distance metric. So this means that a person who wants to use it can just cut and paste the C code. They don't have to think. Uh, well, I mean, hopefully they think. but. They don't have to, to really learn a lot. I think this is one of the reasons. But then there's another life lesson that we should always write in such a way that the largest possible audience can fully understand the paper. And I think that this is something that a lot of researchers don't invest enough time on. 
And this quote is so often attributed to Albert Einstein. It turns out he never said it, but I don't care. Um, I, I love this quote. Is that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler, right? So the first half sounds like the way math is taught in high school. Uh, when we complete the sentence, it's a lot better of a worldview, right? So we actually want to solve real world problems. We actually want to uh, do uh, an analysis of real world phenomenon, but extra complexity is unwelcome. So thank you for listening. Great.